college degree. If you were to go to Harvard College as an undergraduate, you would get a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science from Harvard College, right? It's Harvard University because you see beyond sort of the college, um, they have lots of different uh, post bachelor degree uh, sort of um, options, right? You could go to medical school at Harvard, you could go to divinity school or law school. But at its heart, Harvard is an, a, an undergraduate institution. Right. And so the idea of a liberal arts and sciences college is sort of taking that uh, sort of Harvard college experience and focusing all of the resources of a college onto the undergraduate student experience. Most liberal arts colleges are entirely undergraduate or are undergraduate focused. Um, and here is sort of a word bubble that comes up um, when students think about this idea of a liberal arts college. Generally, when we think of liberal arts colleges, right, um, we want students to not just learn how to be successful in one field or industry, but in many. And this really plays out in the opportunity for taking risks and exploring. At a liberal arts college, you will declare your major, but you probably won't declare your major until your second year at that college or university, right? And what that means is that you might come in and know exactly what you wanna major in, but you also might come in and not be 100% sure. And so you're able to take an anthropology course, take an astronomy course, right? Take a course that maybe hasn't been offered um, in your secondary school and get a sense of, is this a lens through which I want to see the world? We think about the liberal arts educational experience within sort of two frameworks um, of education. The first is this idea of breadth of learning, right? So you're going to learn how to think critically and analyze thoroughly and communicate effectively. The second idea, though, is also really important. And we think about this idea of depth of learning. We very much want you to become an expert in your field. And one of the values of going to a liberal arts college is not only all of your classes being taught by faculty members who are at the top of their fields academically and who are great teachers, but those faculty members, in order to remain at the top of their field academically, are doing a great deal of research. And when they're looking for someone to help them with their research, they're looking at you. And that can truly begin as early as your first year on a liberal arts college campus. And so while, yes, you're going to have the opportunity to explore and to understand the interconnected nature of disciplines and the ways in which problem solving and thinking about any issue our world is facing um, does not come down to your knowledge or experience in just one field, right? It's about sort of thinking how these fields interconnect. Um, if you think about something like COVID-19 right now, there's not just one field or industry that's going to allow our, our communities to overcome this pandemic, right? There are many. And that's really the idea of a liberal arts education is how do we think about problem solving from an interdisciplinary uh, sort of expanse and allow students to get that breadth of learning and that depth of learning. You do not need to apply to a specific major at a liberal arts college. Um, so the most, most students have the opportunity, as I mentioned, right, to explore lots of different pathways and to be excited by new information that you learn in college. We think a lot about the importance of adaptability, right? Um, for so many of us, this spring uh, was a sort of great example of how um, we have to be adaptable as learners, as educators, but as global citizens as well. Um, and so this idea of adaptability is really central in the liberal arts experience. As we discussed when sort of thinking about the university model, right, um, a liberal arts experience is a bit different because 100% of resources on our campuses are devoted to undergraduates. That means that students and their voice in our communities 
are really central to the learning experience and central to the social experience as well. So at Haverford, the average class size is 14. For most liberal arts colleges, you're looking at an average class size of somewhere between 14 and 19 students. And again, all of those classes are taught by faculty members who are at the top of their fields. It also means that you're not just taking one exam at the end of a trimester, at the end of the semester, right? You're writing papers, you're getting feedback from your faculty members, and this idea of sort of um, adaptability plays out in how you're learning throughout the semester. It also means that you're able to be part of a diverse and vibrant residential community. And we think that's so important because we're inviting students from across the globe to come to our campuses. And we don't just want our students to be learning from our amazing professors, but also to be learning from their amazing peers as well. So at most liberal arts colleges, the vast majority of students live on campus. At Haverford College, 98% of our students live on campus and just about 50% of our faculty members. So it's a place a lot of people call home. And we think that's really central to this idea of a living and learning community. We've talked a little bit about this idea of small size and how that impacts your experience in the classroom. But I, I wanna bring home that this means that any um, any, you know, lab uh, experience, um, any uh, sort of instrument on our campus, multi-million dollar telescopes are in our observatory, right? And those are there for our 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 year olds on campus too. Um, so it does mean that you have access to all of these amazing resources and you don't have to wait in line behind graduate students uh, to be able to dive into those. At Haverford, um, we're also one of a handful of institutions in the United States to guarantee undergraduate research. Um, so at Haverford, every student has a senior thesis. And that looks really different depending um, on what you uh, might choose to major in, but it's another opportunity to show that sort of depth of learning. We think a lot about this idea of exploring, right? Um, we want you to have the opportunity, uh, again, to learn from really amazing peers. Uh, but our campuses are also really vibrant outside the classroom. So there are hundreds of clubs and organizations across liberal arts colleges. One of the benefits of being at a liberal arts college is you don't have to be a music major to take a music class, right? You don't have to be a music major to be in our orchestra. You could be a biology major and play violin in the orchestra, or you could be a music major who's also taking uh, part in research happening in one of our biology departments. So you are not defined by your major when you're on our campus, and you are not limited by your major once you graduate from our campuses. We think a lot about this idea of community, not only in terms of as it exists on our campus, but the kind of network that you have um, across the globe, right? And so while um, you know liberal arts colleges are usually on the smaller side compared to um, universities in the United States, they have really strong communities that are global. And I share that um, because I know oftentimes when you're thinking about what's next, right, um, employability is really sort of at the top. Um, here are just some of our top employers for our students who graduated in 2019 and some top graduate schools. Um, and these are specifically for students um, with F1 visas, so international students studying um, who graduated from Haverford and going on to these graduate schools as well. I often like to ask students what they think uh, sort of the most common field that our graduates go into. Um, so at Haverford, we don't have a business degree. You can't major in business. But yet, business is still the most popular field or industry that our graduates go into. Just under 20% of Haverford alums are in um, a business field or industry. And that's because, as I mentioned, right, um, you are not limited by what you major in. You don't have to major in business to go into business. 
We have students who've majored in astronomy, who uh, work for JP Morgan Chase, students who work, who majored in psychology, who work for Facebook, students who've majored in English, who work for Google, right? The idea is that the skill set you bring um, is not just one dimensional. And this is really important because there are studies that show for students who are your age, all right, who are um, thinking about applying to college right now, you will probably have five different, on average, careers, not jobs, but five different careers over the course of your working life. And two of those careers have not yet been established, right? So how do we train you for a career that doesn't yet exist? We can't and we won't. Instead, we'll train you to be flexible and adaptable and think about problem solving so that as your career evolves and as your trajectory grows, you'll be ready for whatever the next step is. As I you know, mentioned earlier, I have the privilege of being able to travel internationally for Haverford. And, and one of my favorite parts of this role is the opportunity to meet with Haverford alums um, all across the globe. And it's really telling to me, um, and this is not just true for, for Haverford, but um, for liberal arts colleges more broadly, but yes, of course, there is a really wonderful Haverford alumni network. Um, but there's also a broader liberal arts college network as well. Um, so I have a, there's an alum from Haverford who works in Singapore and finance, you know, and he says whenever he sees a resume from a liberal arts college grad, he's looking out for them and he's excited to interview them because he knows they'll have a different perspective than someone who's majored in finance at the undergraduate level, right? Um, and so I share these because I want to be clear that going to a liberal arts college doesn't limit you. Instead, it really expands the opportunities and expands the possibilities, right? You'll graduate in four years with a bachelor's of arts or a bachelor of science, and that will really allow you to launch um, into um, whatever is next for you. Within six months of graduation, usually about uh, 90 plus percent of our students are either fully employed in graduate school or doing a year long fellowship. And again, there are, you know, hundreds of employers that are coming to Haverford and liberal arts colleges across the country to specifically recruit our students because of the values that they bring to their, um, you know, to their fields and industries, companies and organizations. I think one of the other sort of aspects of being a student at a liberal arts college that I'd like to share and like to end on is yes, we think about the idea of a great liberal arts education. You learn how to think critically and analyze thoroughly and communicate effectively. We think about this idea of, of depth of learning, right? Um, becoming an expert in your field, having that opportunity to engage. But we also really think about the opportunity to be part of a are deeply intentional and diverse living and learning environment. Um, and when you think about global citizenship, right, your ability to have hard conversations, to learn from your peers, to take some risks, um, to be okay with failing and to have people around you who will lift you up, all of that um, allows you also to be really successful um, once you graduate too. Uh, and so with that, I, I want to really turn it over to you. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can sort of see the chat come in. Um, but I will share my email address um, through that chat. Uh, and hopefully, also, you'll be able to ask me whatever questions are on your mind. Okay, cool, great, um, right, so great first question. So uh, the difference in graduating with a, a physics Bachelor of Arts um, or a Bachelor of Science, um, and you're absolutely right. There are some colleges and universities um, that only offer Bachelor of Arts, others that offer both a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science. Um, the, the difference is really ultimately about whether or not um, you are hoping to apply to graduate schools that require a Bachelor of Science. Um, that's a sort of a one big 
piece to think through. Um, at, at Haverford, we do offer both a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science, depending on um, what you're majoring in. Um, and that's really an option for students uh, to decide what makes the most sense for you. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is um, graduate schools when you're thinking about that. Um, and the other is uh, sort of em employability. Um, there are some employers who really prefer a bachelor of science in a field like physics, um, but others um, you know, might not have a, uh, a strong preference either way. So um, that's a yeah, great question um, and, and definitely one to consider as you're applying. Great uh, question. How does Haverford consider international student uh, student admission? So that's a, a great question. Um, first thing to say is that we have students coming from just about fifty countries, uh, fifty three at last count. Um, about fourteen percent of our students are international students. About ten percent of those um, fourteen percent are students on F one visas. Um, so that's a sort of Im important thing to keep in mind too, right? We're interested in creating a community of students coming from across the United States, yes, but also very much from across the globe. Um, and, and that's, again, a really fun part of our uh, community building exercise in the admission office. All members of our admission staff read international students um, because we think that that's a really essential part of building community. So um, my boss, our, our VP and Dean of Admission and Financial Aid um, will always be one of the readers for students applying from Europe. Um, and then actually for any student to be admitted to Haverford, you'll go through our admission committee. Um, two reads are done on almost every application, again, regardless of citizenship, and we spend a long time. Um, so I'll read about 20, 25 minutes um, for your application on average, um, which is a lot longer than most other places, um, but that really does give us the opportunity to read your application cover to cover. And really the fun part of working in admission is we get to open up your application and say, what is the student trying to share with me, right? We'll look at your high school tr transcript, um, the courses that you've taken, maybe some of you are in set curriculums. Um, and so those are the courses that you've had to take. Maybe some of you, um, have been able to, you know, take uh, to have sort of choice in your in your curriculum. We'll spend some time reading your teacher letters of recommendation, though, again, recognizing that those are really different depending on the kinds of schools that you've gone to. Um, and then the, the most fun part of your application uh, is really the opportunity to hear from you directly through your application essays. Um, so we are a common app or coalition application school, have a personal statement for each of those essays, and then a Haverford specific supplement. Um, so we'll read your application, two people will have that privilege, um, then you'll go to our admission committee um, and we'll talk about you for three minutes or three hours until all eight of us have an understanding of what's best for Haverford and what's best for you. We do, we are need aware uh, for, for international students applying to Haverford, but we do meet full need of all students who are admitted regardless of your citizenship. Um, and so you're able to either fill out the CSS profile or the International Student Financial Aid application, the ISFA. Uh, the ISFA is a paper application, but it's also completely free. Um, so the CSS profile may have costs associated with it, and the ISFA never does. So that's just something for you to consider um, as you're deciding what makes the most sense in terms of um, financial aid. And then the last thing that I'll share uh, we do highly recommend interviews. So these are for students who are planning to apply to college this coming fall. Uh, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. You do have to request an interview. Um, and like I said, I'll just put my email address in the chat right now. Um, I'll be happy to share that interview form as well. Um, but that's a great way for you to get to know Haverford a little bit more and also for us to get to know you a little bit more as well. 
Uh, I didn't mention the SAT uh, or the ACT in terms of our consideration for admission. This is the first year um, of a three-year trial that Haverford has committed to becoming uh, test optional. So we know that there are many students who haven't yet even had the ability to take the SAT or the ACT. We know that there are testing sites that are, you know, continuing to cancel, um, you know, for uh, summer tests and there's uncertainty about the fall. Uh, so if you've taken one of those tests and you think it's a good representation of who you are as a student, you're welcome to send it. And if you haven't taken those tests, you don't need to worry about that for us, right? It's really up to you to decide. Um, and we have no preference. So want students to really feel like they're able to take ownership over that. Um, here, we've got a couple of other great questions that have come in. Um, so we don't offer a uh, water polo, unfortunately. Um, we are part of a larger consortium. I'm not sure if, uh, if you've heard of that term before, but uh, there are a bunch of consortiums across the United States. So there's what's called the Claremont Consortium in Southern California. There's the Five College Consortium in Western Massachusetts. Haverford is part of the Quaker Consortium, which means our students are not only able to take classes at Haverford College, but also at Bryn Mawr College, Swarthmore College, and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and the reason I bring this up in terms of water polo is, well, um, we don't have a a pool on our campus. Bryn Mawr College does. It's less than a mile away. It's uh, just uh, like two kilometers um, down the road and there's a free bus that goes between Haverford and Bryn Mawr every 10-15 minutes um, and you can use the pool for free there as well. So if that's something that's important to you, um, I do think uh, you know you have that opportunity through Bryn Mawr. Uh, another great question, if we were to pursue independent research, how will Haverford support our intellectual curiosity? Um, and I'm so glad you asked that, right? So uh, every student will pursue independent research over the course of their four years. Uh, that is our commitment to you. In admission, we know every student is capable of doing their own independent research, and we want to guarantee that that is a culminating moment in your life as a scholar on our campus. But we don't just throw research on you senior year with your senior thesis, right, and say good luck. That would be terrible. Instead, it's really scaffolded into your curriculum. Because we don't have graduate students, as I mentioned earlier, you're able to begin doing research with faculty as soon as your first year on campus. But we also want to make sure our students have the opportunity to create their own um, opportunities for research, too. So we have three academic centers. They're both physical spaces, but also grant making bodies for our students and our faculty. And when I share their names with you, you might think, okay, that's the center for me as a biology major. That's the center for me as an economics major. That's the center for me as a linguistics major. And it may be, but the idea of these centers are to be deeply interdisciplinary and allow for sort of a collision of disciplines, right? So there's the Koshland Integrated Natural Sciences Center, the Hereford Center for the Arts and Humanities, and the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship. Each of these three centers offers up to a $10,000 US grant for students each summer. If you're on financial aid, we ask that you earn about $2,300 US over the summer, and that CPGC uh, uh, sort of grant would cover your summer earnings expectation as well. And this allows students to travel across the United States and across the globe to either do um, uh, internship experiences with organizations that we already have uh, pre-existing relationships with. You could create your own internship opportunity with an organization um, that you're interested in partnering with, or you can do research and have that funded. Those, those summer experiences, though, is really are just scratching the surface in terms of what is offered through those three centers. They are um, they have student funding to bring speakers and film screenings to campus. Um, if you've published a paper and you're really uh, excited because you've gotten the opportunity to present that at an international conference, you're able to apply for funding and have Haverford, one of those centers, pay for you to go to that conference and present. Um, 
and we send about five students every year to the Nobel Laureates Conference. That's covered entirely through the Center for Peace and Global Citizenship. And we think it's really important for you as an academic, as an intellectual, to create your own pathway and shape your own experience grappling with the issues that you're most excited to ask and answer. And so that's sort of the framework then for that senior thesis experience um, where you're able to dive in very deeply to a topic or issue that's most interesting to you. And many of our students are published um, by the time they graduate or very soon after they graduate because um, the research that they've done is really at the top of their field. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions that have come in um, about uh, sort of traits I look for um, at, at Haver for students coming into Haverford, right? Um, and that's a, a really great question. I think one of the fun pieces of working in admission is that we're not looking for one type of student. Right? Um, we're looking for lots of types of students because um, when we think about building a diverse community, that's not just about uh, students, you know, uh, race and ethnicity or their religious beliefs, but it's also thinking about how they're going to contribute uh, to our community and the ways in which they'll engage. One of the aspects of the Haverford experience that I haven't mentioned is our student run honor code. Um, so at Haverford, uh, our students have a great deal of academic and social freedom and flexibility, and that's afforded through an honor code that is entirely student run. Um, and so I bring this up because we're interested in students who are excited to be part of a community where you learn how the decisions you make don't only impact you, but impact the people and communities around you. So if you're a student who you think you would really excel with a great deal of freedom, then I think Haverford is an amazing place for you and a few examples of that. So as a Haverford student, I never had a proctored exam. So there was never a professor in the room when I took an exam at Haverford. Um, instead, the vast majority of my exams were take home. So a professor would say, you have three hours to do this. You can use your notes and not your textbook give it to me at the beginning of next class. So maybe some of you are morning people, right? You get up really early and you feel like that's when you're at your best. Um, that is definitely not how I am. I am not a morning person whatsoever. So I wouldn't get up to take an exam at 8 a.m. because I would still be waking up. My brain would still be waking up, right? But I had some friends who loved that, who would get up, they'd go for a run, they'd go to breakfast, and they'd take their exam starting at 8 a.m. For me, I started most of my exams at 10 or 11 p.m., right, in the evening, because that's when I felt like I was at my best. If the average class size at Haverford is 14, there might be 14 different times when a student feels like they're best able to articulate what they've learned, and that's the whole point of an exam, right? Um, and so I, I do think that, that uh, students who are excited about academic freedom, who feel like they'll be the best version of themselves, um, sort of when they're asked to live up to their own high expectations for themselves, I do think those are some things that we're thinking about. Um, and that really, comes down to this idea of ethical leadership also, right? So, um, you know, how are you engaging with your community? Um, and, and how has that informed uh, how you feel like you can contribute to your community also? Um, great, some other great uh, conver or questions coming in. Uh, so if a student re receives a scholarship, are study abroad programs covered by that as well? How often do international students go on study abroad programs? Great questions. Uh, so about 40 to 50% of our juniors, so students in their third year, will study abroad for either a, a semester or a year. Um, it's a similar percentage of international students um, that choose to study outside of the United States. Um, and yes, your financial aid does very much go with you. So you'd be asked to pay the same amount to go to any of the 70 Haverford study abroad programs um, as you would be asked to pay if you were a student um, on Haverford's campus. And your flight um, is covered through your financial aid as well. So I studied abroad in Accra in Ghana um, at the University of Ghana. Uh, and it was about 1400 US dollars. Um, this is like 12 years ago to fly from New York City to Accra. Um, and that was covered by the college. So we wanna make sure every student feels like every opportunity is one that they can take advantage of. Uh, 
Great. Other questions that have come in, are there any Bhutanese students um, at Haverford? So not currently. Um, we have had students from Bhutan um, on our campus, uh, though there aren't students who um, are, are Bhutanese on campus right now. So um, would love to have the opportunity to consider your candidacy um, and, and certainly um, excited that you asked that question. We have another great question. Can you explain more about how students are graded during their first year since we don't have a defined major? What kind of classes do we take? That's an awesome question. So one of the things I didn't talk about is the advising system. Um, and this is true both at Haverford but at liberal arts colleges more broadly. So while you don't come in with a, a major, you do come in with an advisor. And this is a faculty member um, who has a small advising group of students. So at Haverford, most advisors have under 10 students. So they know you really well, um, and they're excited to have the opportunity to sit down with you and talk through course selection. So as a student coming into Haverford, I thought I would major um, in either uh, political science or economics um, or anthropology, um, but I also wanted to take a biology class, right? Um, I wanted to take an English class. So your first semester, you'll take some classes that you think you'd like based on what you really loved in high school, um, but you'll also be pushed to take some risks and step outside of your comfort zone also. My freshman year roommate, uh, she came into Haverford and thought she was going to be a medical doctor. She took biology and chemistry and her advisor said, sounds like you have a sort of quantitative, uh, quantitatively driven mind. Why don't you t try an economics class? And she took economics at the sort of encouragement of her advisor and totally loved it. She wound up majoring in economics. She now has her PhD in economics and she works for the Federal Reserve um, as part of the US government. Um, and that was all because an advisor said, you know, here is something that sounds like you might be interested in. So of course there are students who come in, they think they're gonna major in biology and then they go on to do that. Um, but there are other students who are sort of open to that kind of exploration. After you've taken your first year of courses, so it's four courses each semester, you've taken eight courses and you'll probably have a sense your sophomore year about where you want to narrow your focus. Um, even after though you declare your major, you have the opportunity to take courses outside your major. Because again, right, there are so many different disciplines that connect and so many different ways for us to think about problem solving. So I took a music class my senior year um, and that was an awesome way for me to think about connections between uh, political movements um, and, and music and the ways in which those um, intersect and interact with one another. Uh, Great questions. Okay, how rigorous is Haverford's curriculum? Does it have a core or is it open? Um, so Haverford is definitely a, a rigorous place, um, but I do think it's really important to share that it's deeply collaborative. Um, so you'll work hard, absolutely, but you're not going to work hard to be better than your classmates. You're gonna work hard to be a better version of yourself. Um, so that was really freeing for me as a Haverford student. I felt like, it meant that um, I could ask my peers, uh, you know, if there was a problem set in my math class I was struggling with, I could ask my peers um, and they were interested in helping me. Uh, it means that, you know, there are nights where I would read over classmates papers um, and give them some edits or ideas, right? Um, so you're gonna work hard, but you're gonna do so in a really supportive environment. And I think that allows our students to really love the ways in which they're being pushed and challenged academically. We don't have a core curriculum, um, but our curriculum is not quite open either. We have what we call domains of knowledge. And the idea of these is that we wanna make sure students um, have learned to think in uh, different ways across broad curricula. So students will take two classes in creative expression um, that can be uh, you know, a, a fine arts class, but there are some computer science courses um, that fall under that because there's an app development component, right? Um, there are some, there are two classes um, in the social world, right? Um, so you could take a political science class or an economics class, but there are some biology classes that count towards that. 
um, and two classes in sort of natural environments and, and systems. Um, so you could take uh, natural science courses. Um, there are some other courses that would count towards those. So you have choice um, within those domains, but it does mean that you're taking uh, sort of that breadth of learning that we talked about at the beginning. Um, it ensures that that kind of breadth of learning is achieved. The question, um, how are the relationships between professors and students? So that's a great and really important question, right? Because that is one of the great benefits of being at a liberal arts college. Um, I had the opportunity to be a moderator on a panel for uh, a Haverford alums in chemistry. So alums who graduated over the course of the last five years, um, and it was uh, sort of um, co-moderated by a Haverford chemistry faculty member. And she said, once a student shares with me their goal, that feels like my goal, right? And I think that's just such a really beautiful and powerful way. Um, your professors know who you are. They are interested in learning about you and supporting you and your goals. Um, and that's not just for the four years that you're a student on our campus, but that's really for the rest of your life as well. Um, these are gonna be people who are meaningful to you for the next 40 years. Um, because about 50% of our faculty live on campus, it means that you'll see professors in the dining room having lunch. Uh, you'll see professors in our coffee shop grabbing a cup of coffee. Um, it means that you'll chat with them about, you know, the, that class that you were just in together, um, but also what else is happening in your life. And that kind of relationship building, um, again, is what I think allows our students to really feel supported by faculty. That's important not only in terms of your happiness on our campus, but it's also important when you're looking to apply to graduate schools, right? You have faculty who know you well, who are able to speak to your strengths and what you'll add to those specific departments, and they're really excited to support you in whatever comes next. Um, so both, again, I think a real benefit to being a Haverford student um, and a liberal arts college student, but also a benefit um, as you're thinking about your life beyond um, our our campuses as well. So uh, one question's come in, uh, how strong should our academic achievements be to get accepted? Um, and that's a good question and a sort of hard question to, to answer uh, because we don't have a formula for admission, right? There's no checklist for admission. Um, we are highly selective, so um, we're not able to admit every student who is compelling, right? In fact, we um, uh, have to let go of the ma vast majority of students who are compelling candidates. Um, but again, we do take all pieces of your application um, into consideration. Students are usually at the top of their class um, or near the top of their class, so they've done well in challenging curriculums. Um, but again, that's not the only thing that we're looking at. We're thinking about you as a student, absolutely, but also you very much as a community member as well. I want to be mindful of our time um, and, and know that we only have uh, sort of a few minutes um, left together uh, and, and just sort of ask for final questions. Um, and, and like I said, I'll share, um, continue to share my email address with you all. Uh, will English proficiency tests be required for fall 2021 applications? So, so yes, um, if English isn't your primary language uh, of education um, or is not um, the primary language spoken at home, we will require either the TOEFL, the IELTS, or the Duolingo English test. Um, so we do require one of those three. Um, we have a few cutoffs that I hope are sort of helpful. So um, we require 100 or above on the TOEFL, a seven or above on the IELTS, um, and on the new Duolingo English test, we, we require a 120 or above. Um, so those are the only tests that will um, sort of require just one of those, not, not all three, please don't take all three, uh, but just one of those tests. And especially recognizing the limitations of COVID-19 um, and, and testing opportunities, um, that was one of the reasons that we signed on um, to the Duolingo English test because we think that's a great way um, and a very low cost option um, for students to take an English proficiency test um, in your home, right? Um, so that's a, a sort of important piece to highlight also. Any final questions?
Awesome. Well, again, I'm going to put my email address here in the chat. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time uh, to learn about Haverford and to learn about liberal arts colleges. Um, I am really honored uh, to have the chance to chat with you today and hope we'll continue this conversation. So please don't hesitate to reach out with my um, using my email address. Let me know what other questions evolve, whether they're about Haverford or liberal arts colleges. Um, and I'm certainly happy to share additional resources surrounding opportunities to interview um, as well. So uh, take good care. I hope you and your families stay uh, safe and healthy. And I look forward to being in touch uh, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. It was wonderful to have you here today. Have a wonderful day as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye.